Welcome back. Big Bank, even bigger story. James Freeman is out with a new book chronicling the history of one of America's largest financial institutions. The book is titled Borrowed Time, Two Centuries of Booms, Busts, and Bailouts at City. James, congratulations on the book. We're so happy you're here to talk Thanks. about it. Good to be here. Uh, t tell us the, the, the takeaway that you have in Borrowed Time. Yeah, I think a big takeaway is that uh, regulation and government support uh, through history doesn't work. Uh, we, we look at a bank that uh, it's been here two centuries. The first century, it's an independent organization. Uh, there's no federal backstop. There's no taxpayer exposure. Knowing that they are going to accept the consequences of failure, you had very careful bankers running a very strong bank. Uh, uh, people most Americans have never heard of, uh, Moses Taylor, James Stillman. They built the largest bank in the country and it uh, wasn't necessarily fun to work there. Stillman, uh, you know, he ruled by absolute fear. He was a, a maniac about examining their credit risks and wow. demanding information from people they were going to lend to. Uh, it was such a strong bank, so highly capitalized that they actually rescued the government a couple times in the 1890s. Then once the taxpayer safety net comes in, political operators start running the bank. And within years of the Federal Reserve uh, being created, Citi is there borrowing heavily from the New York Fed. Now, we'd love to know all the details about that, but uh, the Fed won't share the documents. They've probably been destroyed. This is uh, kind of an ongoing problem where the, uh, the Federal Reserve hides and then destroys uh, documents related to their uh, supervision of banks. And, and in recent years, you really saw how strong or weak the bank is, especially when it was tested during the financial crisis. Yeah, the, the, the weakest of the banks. It, it needed the biggest bank bailout, uh, 45 billion direct government investment, hundreds of billions of more in debt guarantees, various other assistance. And it was a complete failure. And I think it's the, it's the, the government backstop, which is the root of it, because a lot of people during the crisis, they like to say that this or that particular instrument or, or Wall Street gambling was the cause. But but you look at uh, Citi, and we were able to pull uh, one document out of the FDIC. It showed problems across the bank, from the most complex financial instrument in, the, in Wall Street trading to the most simple loan. Hmm. So it was the underlying problem is, is the government safety net, uh, which encourages risk taking. And, and government policies driving people into housing. James, congratulations on the book. Oh, Frankly, I'm, I was delighted to find out what it, the topic was. When I saw the title, Borrowed Time, I thought it was my medical report, so I'm <laughs> delighted to hear that it wasn't. <laughs> but I think your book is more uh, a message than just a book. And the message is Thanks. that when banks operate with prudence and they operate the old-fashioned way where they stand up for themselves and they're responsible to their stockholders and to their employees and to their customers, that's a solid bank. But when they start depending upon the government and know the government's going to bail them out. They operate with a level of greed that you expose in this book. I think it's an incredibly valuable message that I hope people in government will read because the politicians need to not make this mistake again by providing all of this uh, safety net for, for these banks who operate like these guys operated. Great point. Well, thanks. And, I, and I'm hoping this is maybe a moment where it's a good time. Banks are healthy again. They're strong. They're, they're making money. They're returning capital to shareholders, which maybe should make taxpayers a little nervous, but, but I think it is a good time to say, let's start peeling back that safety net. I understand if, if the government said tomorrow everything's changed and we're going to let everyone fail, it, it would be a little chaotic. So you start a phased withdrawal. Policies, laws, regulations, you start making it clear that we're going to let people fail again. And, and you know, there, there's a, uh, obviously bankruptcy was not an option anyone wanted in 08, but, but the beauty of that is it does uh, allow new competitors, more innovative competitors to arise, and, and it, uh, it allows uh, uh, people to suffer, investors to suffer the consequences of their decisions. And, but, you know, this is not about, obviously you can have your deposit insurance. It's about making investors who make bad decisions live with it. Yeah. Just quickly, you just said there were problems across the board that were right. quite obvious. So then why do you think the government bailed them out? It's, it's funny. It's kind of it's a mystery so even to some of the people doing the bailouts. Sheila Baer, who was running the FDIC, was kind of saying, you know, where's the analysis and where's the real argument that we really should rescue these guys? Um, and, and it was just kind of presumed. And this is um, one of the reasons we wrote the book is to show that this kind of too big to fail mentality 
was built over decades. It wasn't just, oh, wait, someone decided a bank like Citi has to be saved. Mm -hmm. It was just presumed. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson said, uh, if it's not too big to fail, I don't know what is. But there's no analysis to say we couldn't live without Citi. And I, I think you look at this economy, there are a lot of these institutions we, we probably could live without. Well, so someone who was against TARP, one of the few Republicans who openly was against it, and I still am, I want to say thanks for, for exposing and peeling the onion back a little bit and, and letting oh, people thanks. realize that this wasn't the absolute, if we don't do this, you know, it's Armageddon. And yeah. I, I think that's what we were told in 08. I never believed it then. I think your book helps to point out. Would it have been disastrous? Yes. But would it have been the end of the world? Probably not. Just the end of some very bad banking procedures. Mm. Thanks. And, and you know, it's, it, it really went well beyond city, as you point out. You go back to March of 08. The government decided to rescue the creditors of Bear Stearns. Not even a bank. Uh, maybe the 17th largest institution in the right. financial industry. I mean... So is it because we were in a moment of time, in time that they were worried that the lights were going to go out on GE and that, you know, things were coming to a halt given that the, the, the buck broke? Yeah, there, there was definitely a, a lot of fear, and, and, and it was based on gut instinct more than, more than math, uh, um, I would say. But, and, and I understand it was difficult because I think only the government can create a problem that big where... One, one reason it was so challenging is you look uh, roughly 20 years before then, Drexel Burnham, big investment bank, failed, life went on. But in uh, 08, you had the government pushing everybody into housing investment, uh, rewarding banks for holding AAA-rated mortgage-backed securities. So you had the same problem across the industry. So I understand the fear of letting all of these institutions uh, take a hit and right. have to recognize their fear. losses. Yeah. But, uh, but, I, but I think certainly the bailout culture was building over time where, where as, as the governor said, the, the, knowing the safety net was there made these banks run at very high levels of leverage. And it was an election year. Let's not forget that. Well, That's point. a big motive. There's That's always that. that. Election You're right. <laughs> James Freeman, the book is Borrowed Time, Two Centuries of Booms, Busts, and Bailouts at City. Go check it out. James Freeman, congratulations again. Thanks a lot. Uh, a very important book.